Good day, nerds, and welcome to episode 56 of the Nerd Cantina Show. And today, Steve and I are going to recap the weekly news, starting with some quick entertainment talk. And then we'll move into tech with some stories that are talk about the, how the world is relying now on Chinese AI. Tesla opens up its gigafactory in China. We've got the U.S. Pentagon warning military consumers to be advised that the DNA test kits out there may have some risks. A notorious hacker and man behind many cyber attacks in the U.S. is now working within China. And then some news around self-driving cars, both in the U.S. and internationally. Much to get through? Let's get started. Calling back all nerds. Nerds! Welcome back, nerds, to episode 56 of the Nerd Cantina Show. And this episode is uh, is brought to you by vacationing. And uh, we, we've got... <laughs> I, I am sitting in my car. Uh, it's about 35 degrees out in uh, in Joshua Tree National Park, sitting outside my RV. And uh, I did not plan ahead. So if you hear some external noise or whatever else, that's that's the sounds of, uh, of the wilderness. And... Yeah. Yeah. Noisy ass people at a camp- campground. <laughs> and technically, this is our last recording of the decade uh, of 2019, but it won't air until the first day of 2020. So we're going to do a little uh, kind of time traveling on this episode. So to us, it's the last episode of the year. To you, it's the first episode of the year. So let's have some fun. Yeah, so uh so happy new year and this is a a tough time. I was just telling uh telling you Steve that between Christmas and New Year's time ceased to exist. Like the understanding of uh of what day of the week or whatever else is completely meaningless to me as I mostly take this time off of work. Uh so this this snuck, snuck up on me here. But uh time is a man-made construct. <laughs> But there's uh there's there's some to, to get time through. Is, time is just a man made construct. <laughs> if you want to call it Wednesday at nine p.m., fuck it, it is like it's, it's how it goes. <laughs> but really, what we're, uh, we're I think I think a lot of the the world uh, has shut down at this time. We don't have a ton coming through in the entertainment side. Uh, one uh, one piece of of entertainment that I know I know you missed out on last week, and that was was telling us some juicy story. Oh, uh, so we were so wrapped up in talking about the rise of Skywalker. I totally forgot a a funny story that kind of happened to me walking in. So Stu came by before I went to the movie, and I told him I was going by myself. And I was like, "Man, you're not going to go see this on premiere night." He was like, "No, I'll probably try to get there over the weekend." I was like, "What the fuck are you doing right now? Like, it's nine forty five. Like, it's a nine forty five show." So he's like, are, are there tickets left? And there wasn't any tickets left in the Dolby Theater, which I was going to, but there were some seats left in the IMAX, and they were both playing at the same time. So he's like, yeah, fuck it. I'm, I'm going. You know. So we both hop in the car. We drive down to the theater, get there a little bit early so we could partake in some greenage in the parking lot. And we're sitting in the parking lot, and the car, like two cars next to me, has two dudes and, and two girls in, in the car, and they're just sitting there waiting, too. So I was like, I, I know what these guys are doing. So me and Stu leave the car. Me and Stu leave the car, and the the other car starts to empty at the same time. So I was like, okay, yeah, like <laughs> like everyone's taking the same cues. And as I'm walking up, I was like, I was, I was walking past the group. I was like, who's pumped up for Star Wars? You know, and fucking this dude was just like, I don't think anybody more than me. And I was like, really, pal? I got Darth Vader tattooed on my hands. I think I think I might have you beat. And he was like, I got a Star Wars sleeve. You know, like all arrogant. Like, like what? Like, I got a Star Wars sleeve. And then, like, I was like, okay, cool. And I kept walking. And then he was like, and I got it on my knuckles. And I was like, I got it on my knuckles. You know? <laughs> so, like, this, we, like, kind of, like, gave each other that stepbrothers look like, did we just become best friends? You know? like, <laughs> so we're standing in line. He's got, he's got dark side across his knuckles. I got Sith Lord across my knuckles. He's got, like, this Vader, like, Star Wars sleeve on his forearm. I got the two hand tattoos. And we were both just, like, looking at each other, like, how the fuck does this happen? Like, we park next to each other at the same show, walk at the same time. It was just I was like, hey man, you gotta you gotta let me get a picture for for the 
my podcast Instagram. Like I wanted a picture of just our knuckles together. One says Sith Lord, one says Dark Side. But his girlfriend was just like so frustrated about being late to the show. <laughs> like, <laughs> and we both know there was tons of like previews. He's like, no, no, it's, no, it's cool, it's cool. Like, dudes, like that. And she's like, let's go, let's go. <laughs> I was just like, damn, lady, like you don't see how this is like kismet. <laughs> like, you don't, you don't get this right now. <laughs> like, we just, we just made friends. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i went in the concession line they dipped off i didn't get my picture i was pissed but it was just so funny to walk out of the car and he was just like i got his darth Vader sleeve and i got it on my knuckles like he was like he dropped the mic on me and i just caught that bitch before it hit the floor i was like i got i got star wars tattooed on my knuckles and we both kind of just gave this like confused look like how the fuck like wait what like what <laughs> and then yeah we both watched a shitty movie <laughs> it's like the it's like the start of a of a beautiful nerd rom com there. <laughs> well, it was, uh, yeah, it was like uh, out of all the people, parking lots packed. You know, a couple hundred people going to see the premieres at the. You know, they had like five theaters playing. You know, at once, and we both just walk out of the car at the same time. It was hilarious. It's like, what are the odds? Yeah, hopefully you gave him a, a cantina sticker and he he joined the group, but. but uh, I did promote the show. I did promote the show. I see his buddy that was with him was definitely was definitely interested. You know, when I said I need to take a picture for my my podcast Instagram, he was like, "You got a podcast, bro?" It's like, "What's your podcast called?" You know, it's like it's the Nerd Cantina show. And he like literally by the time we got to the concession line, he showed me his phone. He subscribed. He was like, "Boom, got you, bro. Got it." So, <laughs> dude from Star Wars, if you're listening to this, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Send us a picture of those tattoos. Put it in the group. At the nerdcantina.com forward slash community. And uh, <laughs> go ahead and show Steve that your tattoos are better. Um, well, yeah. Star uh, Wars is still is still probably the... the <laughs> Star Wars is still the, the dominating you know force in entertainment talk this week. That uh, The movie is, is still leading in the box office, obviously. It's, it's going to probably for, for a period of time. It was a big drop off this week uh, from the first week, but... Uh, as expected, I think uh, last time I looked, it is outperforming like the Last Jedi. I, I I don't know. Is that even news? You know, that, is there any question that it's going to make money? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, not really. Uh, <laughs> though the headline I did see though is that it did not do that well in China. Yeah, that I saw that too. A, I, one of the worst start, one of the worst Star Wars openings in China of the franchise. Yeah, which will delay its rise to a billion dollars worldwide but it's still it's still on track to do so um but i, I did see the two i don't know what what the driving factor I don't know. is people are taking people are taking bets on if it's going to hit a billy or not i don't know oh i think i, I'll I take think that it bet. doesn't hit a billy oh, i'll take that you'll bet. take the over <laughs> i'll take the over it's going I think over i'm gonna take the under i think i'm yeah. a, i think i'm gonna take the under all right so it, it's still this uh movie still dividing fans pretty uh pretty harshly as far as you know what, what people think about it and uh and what their experiences are we We've released our uh, Patreon exclusive spoiler full uh, review and, and what our thoughts of the movie is. So anybody you can, can go to the Patreon page, listen to that for a dollar, measly buck. <laughs> and then, you know, outside of the movie, you also have uh, The Mandalorian wrapping up its first season this last week. And uh, I don't know, I still, I, I love that show. I think, I think the vast majority of people, I think that's one that isn't dividing fans. Uh, I think the vast majority of people maybe th- thought the first couple episodes were a little slow and uh, and didn't didn't carry much of a storyline, uh, but you see that it all did kind of come to a payoff at the end. That it it does tie in uh, everything throughout the season pretty well, and uh, overall just good good well put together show, regardless whether it was Star Wars or not. Yeah, I don't know what people are kind of expecting from from a TV show. Like why every episode has to have huge you know meaning in the star wars universe why we can't just take nice one-off you know episodes i mean that's that's the tv we grew up on you know you had a season of 22 episodes for your favorite show and only maybe eight of them 10 of them really progress the overall um carrying over plot or narrative that they're doing the other you know 12 to 14 were just basic filler episodes to either develop characters or just tell a one-off story um i don't know 
if we're moving to a different point in television, now that we have so much content to consume and TV is kind of really taking the forefront of entertainment in, in the, the, you know, entertainment industry, I, I just, I don't know where the complaints are really coming from. I don't, I don't get it. I, I think it really is just, it, it depends on what service you're on. I think if you're still on broadcast television, there, there is less of a, of a necessary complete tie-in. And then the streaming services, it's almost like watching just a 10 episode movie or whatever it happens to be. The, the, the expectation is really, you know, the fact that there's end credits after one episode or the other is meaningless. The fact that an episode ends is meaningless. It, it's all just, it's going to, it's going to continue and auto play the next episode anyway. Uh, and there's more of an expectation that things just tie very closely together, that they're loosely coupled or very tightly coupled together from one episode to the next. And yeah, Mandalorian see, I'm, wasn't quite I'm that. not that much of a binger, you know, so like I'll get to watch maybe two, three episodes a night after the kids go to bed and Kristen's either on her phone or, or goes to bed early. So I'll get, I'll get maybe two, three episodes a night and I'm not trying to just pound out three episodes unless it's a show I, I need to get through so we can talk about it on the podcast but like lately i've been watching you know i would watch one episode of mandalorian one episode of the witcher and then you know maybe one episode of something else or log on and play you know Fortnite overwatch for a couple minutes with with somebody that's online you know i'm not i don't i don't get too like wrapped up in in one single show and just pound it out like that i kind of like to stretch it out and digest all these episodes for for a day and let them kind of sit. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I, I maybe watch an episode a night uh, of of something. So I'm always trying to play catch up, and I, I do not binge um, really anything more than more than a, maybe two in a night or something like that. So it's uh, it's I don't don't care, and I think the Mandalorian still I think it still played out this kind of episodic way of of telling the story well. Um, this week, you you get a few people mad at uh, at Jason Sudeikis. Uh, he, he might have he, he might have gotten some hate thrown at him on Twitter or whatever, uh, as Jason Sudeikis was uh, was the voice of one of those stormtroopers at the beginning of the episode. Yeah, they uh, they're all mad about the child abuse. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I will say at least you didn't see like glove to green skin kind of like it was him punching a bag but in your mind that cute little fucker was in there and man everybody got triggered everybody got <laughs> triggered the, the only reason why you don't see glove to green actual face is probably because the the animatronics team the the, the puppeteering oh, team that put that expensive. together <laughs> oh yeah those they would they would have absolutely shit themselves if somebody was actually punching it um, and Disney shit the bed on quality merchandise for that fucker, so you couldn't just put a a, a figure in there, or a, you know, an actual scale doll or something. Well, I mean, Disney didn't <laughs> didn't shit the bed necessarily on the 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 lack of merchandise for Christmas. I know that there's a lot of stories that talk about how it, you know, they they lost a bunch of money because they didn't have the merchandise. But the reason why they didn't, rumored wise, is uh. You know, John Favreau's decision, and he kind of strong armed Disney into not uh, pre making the toys or pre releasing the toys uh, based off of, of some advice. It says based off some advice off of like, uh, what's his name? Childish Gambino uh, talking about how he loves to be surprised by, by these things. And everybody knows that if Disney would have put in an order for Baby Yoda toys or whatever else ahead of the Christmas season, ahead of the actual, it would have had to happen before the season. That would have been leaked. And the reveal of episode one would not have been a special if everybody kind of knew and was waiting to see a Baby Yoda. So they intentionally didn't create toys and create these things in order to to best keep it secretive uh, and have an actual kind of viral moment come out of the show. You don't think that the after the episode one, when it was revealed and they hit the go button on mass production, like it takes that long. Like so, th- so you don't even think they had, um, like models pre-made that only sat in the Disney warehouse waiting to hand over to toy companies. Like the whole process didn't even start till, till episode one finished. My assumption is that 
it's it's harder than any of us think. Cause they, because they they made the animatronic. Yeah, they Disney, made the fucking animatronic. Yeah, people knew there was a Baby Yoda for a long time. Like, yeah, but those people were chained into the fucking basement underneath Disney World. Like, <laughs> those dudes were not allowed to go home. Uh, so, I think, I like I said, I, I've got to make the assumption that no, it's not that easy. Because if it is, Disney's not leaving money on the fucking table. If it's if it's an easy thing to figure out. Yeah, I just think it was it, like it. There must have been something out of their control because either you push up the release of Disney Plus so that you can get Mandalorian released a month earlier and start that process. Like you know that there's 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 people mad that they didn't have merchandise for Christmas. Like that 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 has to be a thing. Yeah, but I, I think in the end. Uh... I think they, I think they, they did it well. It's just like you know, before Endgame, before any of these big movies, there's all kinds of people speculating on these toys that are being made and these toys that are. Oh yeah, are Stu, released. Stu and, ruined fucking Infinity War for me, or was it Infinity War or Endgame? But either way, they uh, they had they released a Thor toy. Yeah, it was Infinity War. They released a Thor toy to where you could see the uh, Stormbreaker hammer was Groot's arm. And yeah. he was like, you know, he came in and he was like, yeah, I seen a toy of Thor. And you could tell that the, the handle of the new hammer was was Groot's arm. So when that scene happened and they were making the hammer and then they show Groot, I, like it was just totally ruined for me. It was just totally fucking ruined. And I was mad at Stu. I was mad at Hasbro. I was mad at everybody. I told him fucking eat a dick. Yeah. So there you go. I think John Favreau intentionally, uh, intentionally did this to Disney. And Disney can deal with the lo- loss of profits. And in the end, they win because of how viral this show went. That says a lot to John Favreau's pull at Disney then. Like, cause. Yeah. yeah. John Favreau should run everything at this (laughs) point in time. (laughs) Let John Favreau take Star Wars. Let him be, you know, let him be the overall mastermind showrunner of, of all things Star Wars. Cause that's what they desperately need is somebody who keeps continuity across all media devices. Yeah. Kathleen Kennedy needs to take the Game of Thrones walk of shame and let us all throw tomatoes <laughs> at her naked as she walks through the street. As people just yell shame at her, it's fucking horrible. All right, but let's let's uh move on to uh to some some tech news here, and uh and do our little weekly wrap up there. And first one is, well, we've got some news on coming out of uh, PC Mag about how the world is relying on on chi- Chinese AI. Uh, primarily in the domain of surveillance, and I guess this to me is an is a no brainer. I think that kind of makes sense because there is no greater country uh, that surveils its people than China. So yeah, they're they're the leader in this technology, of course. But as we've we've always talked about, um, relying on Chinese AI opens up us to national security questions. Uh, so. As as private companies in the United States, as our government needs to utilize AI to streamline systems and to to innovate and things like that, if we are only allowing or always looking towards China to to bring in this AI, you know, like so spying on on each other's countries has always been a thing. You know, it's usually done by humans. But we're going to have artificial intelligence spies <laughs> that that have arterial motives. You know, sure, I'll come in, help you process this data. But I'm also going to backdoor it to, you know, G. Isn't that, how, isn't that the Chinese president, G? Yeah. You know, and so. I, I mean, all of the the AI, facial recognition, all the surveillance tools that, uh, that China has, I you know, it's obviously being used as an authoritarian regime over there uh, to control the behavior of other people pretty harshly. Um, it's also, you know, being farmed out to these other authoritarian countries across the world, uh, as most of the, the countries who are using surveillance technology and AI technology are, are getting it from China. Uh, and then, yeah, there's, there's always threats. I, you know, tinfoil hat says... You know what? What stops Chinese nationalists or whatever else from from putting some pretty basic cameras in and around sensitive areas of our country, or whatever else that 
hey, they just link up to Wi-Fi, they link up to to satellite internet, and they're just these passive cameras that sit there. And the AI can now detect people, and it can, with great accuracy, determine who somebody is based off of their walk. Like you can completely cover your face, and the Chinese AI is it has proven that it can identify people just by their gait and how they walk. Um, so. Yeah, there's there's ways I, I could think of a lot of different ways that that could be used for well, and this, espionage and for tools within the country. This tells you know also to me is a big red flag on why we can't rely on capitalism to solve all our our problems. You know, um, when it comes to innovation, our country only innovates what is profitable, and there really isn't profit other than the you know military industrial complex to to protect our country to protect our nation it's not a very profitable endeavor you know what i mean so you're not going to have our country's smartest minds working on some of the issues that are really most important to protecting our our nation's security, you know, so that that's kind of what what scares me is that we've relied on the free market to be our our biggest innovator, and I mean, granted, yeah, we have some really cool phones, we got some really cool cameras and fun drones to fly and things like that, but when it comes to certain advancements that we need uh, for our society, they're lagging behind because we haven't figured out a way to make them profitable yet. And profit, you know, national security is starting to become second to, to profit. Yeah. And I, I, we talked about it last week. I mean, the part of the issue is, is AI and all of these things are going to get developed faster than we can get, lawmakers, politicians, regular policymakers, individuals in acquisitions for the military or department, that they respond so much slower than the technology is actually advancing at this point in time uh, that we can't agree on the problem, which means you can never figure out a solution. And uh, we'll we'll see where this all all heads. But it is kind of scary to hear that, uh, you know, we're not the leader in what is a, a huge mar- emerging market, which is the, the the biggest kind of forefront towards uh, technological innovation is in machine learning and AI. And we're not the leader in the world. Uh, China is the one who's exporting this to, to more and more countries. Uh, and there's always fears that, uh, that one, they're, they're going to start promoting this towards more author- authoritarian uh, governments that are going, this technology absolutely has the, the ability to limit freedoms of people worldwide and man I think oh, yeah. a lot of countries you know, are take Russia, the lead on that. you know Russia just can't wait to get their hands on this stuff and really well, put down the the iron and, skiff on on their on their society and not even Russia you got to think that you know the all of the african nations that are just now hitting their industrial revolution um, that are just now being propped up into some kind of uh, economic power and yeah, they're they're hitting a societal fork in the road to where they're 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 gonna have a choice to either go the more democratic route, like like the Western world, or they can go the more of the dictator route, like like the Eastern world. And you know, you see China laying down its influence on which way they should go. Yeah. Well, and and the. The control of and use of surveillance technology, the control and weaponization, essentially, of internet uh, within a country, those are absolutely the tools of a, of a modern uh, dictator. And China's got got the tech; they've got the tech to sell those dictators. They've got the the proven track record on how to do it effectively. So that's a uh, it's something to be concerned about. It's something uh, we'll see as we go in the future. But as of today. Uh, you know, right now they are definitely the leader in in AI research, in surveillance technology, uh, and a lot of that technology is coming from these companies that we've talked about in the past, like Huawei, uh, as they're they're farming out this uh, this tech across the world. So, well, our next story is actually a little positive because this is a a story of actually China needing to buy innovation from our country. So that's, I mean, that's one glimmering ray of hope. Yeah, and that's uh, you know the 
the Tesla Gigafactory uh, in China uh, opens up and it builds out. We've got te- the news earlier in the week that Tesla got uh, you know a 1.4 billion dollar loan from Chinese banks in order to build its Gigafactory in China. But technically, this Gigafactory was started back in 2018. Um, so ground was broken uh, back in, in 2018. This Gigafactory has been coming. Um, so this first article that we had from TechCrunch talks about how they just got this loan from China to build out its Gigafactory. But the truth is, the actually the first 15 Tesla Model 3s from that Gigafactory were delivered this week as well. So that Gigafactory is up and running now um, on low scale. Uh, but they fulfilled their first 15 pre-orders this week. Uh, so you got some, some Tesla Model 3s that were built in China now driving the streets of Shanghai. And... Uh, What's going to be interesting about, you know, as the prevalence of like Teslas and things going going to China, you know, China's not going to, they're not going to have all the hangups that we have on autonomous driving. Um, they're going to probably welcome it with open arms. Oh, for um, sure. Having these cars that are fully autonomous and all of their GPS data, whatever else is going to route through, obviously government servers and government tracking. Uh, and they're, they're probably loving this opportunity to have autonomous driving cars uh, that are link through government systems and they can track their population even better uh across the across the country as they they drive so absolutely i expect china to in the next in the very near future to to roll out as many of these as possible and we'll see we'll start to hear news that their cities are going to be completely optimized for recharging stations for uh ensuring that uh Tesla's electronic vehicles and autonomous vehicles uh, have a place in their country. Well, as far as like the the governmental overreach into privacy is concerned, you know, yeah, it sucks. I don't agree with it, but I'm not Chinese, so it's a your problem, not a my problem. Um, but the good thing that it will come out of it is is China globally leaves one of the largest carbon footprints on this fucking planet. So if their need to know where everyone's driving and you know what I mean, their there's their need to have an, a giant overreach on their society's uh, privacy is what drives them to have an entire country of electric cars and start their electric automobile, you know, kind of uh, infrastructure, then I mean, I'm okay with that trade-off. Feel like again, I said I'm not. You know, it's shitty. I would never live in China and want to be under that. But it is what it is. And if that's you know, if if they're going to double down on one problem, at least we're solving another. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a, a good way to look at it for for the international community. And uh, I, I think it's it's interesting. We'll, we'll see uh, how many what type of production comes out of this Gigafactory and how how you know how fast they can get get these cars out to the to the billion people over there in china but uh definitely well, uh, i definitely mean up just and running. just the fact that there is a gigafactory out there i mean how many ford fucking plants were out in china before you know what i mean like <laughs> no idea <laughs> you didn't you, i don't think there were too many f-150s riding around <laughs> riding around you know uh shanghai <laughs> so the yeah, fact i mean that- that's true at, at least it's still u.s patents u.s company uh, that is, well, that and, is and Tesla's there. open source, so I don't think Tesla's worried about patents or anything like that. You know what I mean? Tesla's always been open source, um, so I don't think they care. But the fact that China reached out to an American company was like, hey, you guys got a good thing going. And they didn't just che- uh, choose to steal it and do it on their own, that they were like, no, come on. You know, like this is them participating in, in world trade and, and, you know, what the tariffs and and everything was supposed to try to encourage. So the fact that they have an American company making American products for Chinese citizens in China, you know, we've, we've had plenty of, of Toyota and Nissan and all kinds of factories in our country. You know, this is, this is uh, the beginning of maybe something positive. All right. Well, we have a, one more story. We'll go back on the darker side of China. Uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> as we've there, there's a some news coming out this week uh, that you know, one of uh, a big time hacker uh, in the U.S. who was responsible for many cyber attacks in the U.S. Uh, served 18 years in federal prison. Uh, he is he is now out and uh, and he is back in China. As he was a China, he's national. And he is back in China 
teaching uh, cyber uh, in uh, within that country. So we've got a, a, a big time hacker who gets released from prison here and goes back to China and is now, uh, okay, so, now teaching. So what I want to know is, is, all right, so how long was he in jail? 18 months. So, okay, 18 months. It's not that long. You know, I just don't understand how you get locked up. You're out of touch with the world for for a decent amount of time. And you come out and you're still, like, current on all the, <laughs> you know, things that you need to do for hacking and, and things like that. You know, we should have should have maybe held them a little longer just to give a <laughs> – just to let innovation kind of get way ahead of them. So, when he gets out, he's no longer still – uh, one of the leading hackers to to be teaching Chinese people how to protect or, you know, like, yeah, I'm sure he's he's teaching China how to protect from hacks. But as you learn defense, you also learn a little bit about offense. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I don't know if this is a, a net positive. Yeah, I, I don't know either. And uh, it's just something, uh, yeah, a, a quick mention, but there's much imp- implications here. Uh, you know, we can't keep him forever. And, uh, he goes back to China where, where he came from. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we don't, don't hear his name or he's not teaching some school of people mean, on how to hack we, systems or whatever else. We but. shouldn't keep him forever, but I'm pretty sure there's a couple Muslims in Guantanamo that would argue with you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that when the U.S. government wants to keep you for an indefinite amount of time, they have the means to do so. And um, yeah, if I I fear, so, you know, so when it comes to like us at home, actual Americans at home, I fear a Chinese hacker ten times more than I fear a fucking ISIS fighter. And we just let a Chinese hacker out in eighteen months, and we still got dudes from from the Iraq war in Guantanamo. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, that's a completely different debate there, but, uh, no, oh, let's, uh, let's take ourselves out of China for a second here. And, uh, and we can, uh, we can have a conversation on, uh, so this week we get a, a warning coming out of the Pentagon, uh, warning all military consumers that, uh, the DNA test kits, so we're talking about Ancestry, 23andMe, um, having some uh, some potential uh, implications towards the career of military members as the, the data that they collect is is not always accurate. Uh, the Specifically, like the health data uh, that they get, the DNA markers or whatever else they find for, uh, for health data is not necessarily accurate, and it's not necessarily private, and if disclosed in the military, it may affect their their potential to uh, to continue their career or uh, or be able to serve. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information in your DNA, and as as we find out more about DNA, you know, once we have your genetic code, the genetic code's there. So as we understand more and more about the what the DNA can tell us, we don't need to do another DNA test. We already have your genetic code, so we can we can just learn more about how that code what that code tells us. So if you take one DNA test for, for one of these private companies, as time goes by and as they become better at, at reading that code, we can be opening ourselves up to, to some, you know, some dangers that, that we can't foresee right now. Yeah. And that's really what they're, they're, uh, they're hinting at. It, it, they, they hint at the fact that, you know, you, they may uncover something in your, DNA test that that triggers it sounded more like a medical warning that if you find out through these DNA test kits that you have some disease or something else that is not uh, considered qualified for military service, technically, if you find that out, uh, even if it's not a privacy issue, right? If you find that stuff out, technically, you have to disclose that to the military, and then once disclosed, that may say, okay, well, you you know, you're ten years into your career, you got to go. Um, or you're attempting to join the military and you know about these certain medical conditions that 23andMe say you have, you've got to go you, or you can't serve. So I think that's, that's where a part of what they're, they're, uh, they're concerned about. This, this is, stuff is always, prison. always scared me. Like, you know, I've always been interested. I do want to know, you know, all my percentages and, and my, my lineage and things like that, but not at the cost of what people could potentially use this for. I mean, I've always had 
the the notion that I have two daughters and if somebody ever lays a hand on one of my daughters, I might need to bury a body somewhere and I don't want <laughs> my DNA being public record for, of any any company in case in case I leave an eyebrow somewhere. <laughs> that that's always been my first notion. Um but yeah, secondly, I just don't I don't like the fact that one, I have to pay you 200 bucks for this test. So I pay you 200 bucks. All right. Then you give me a little bit of information. All right. Thanks for the information. But then you also take that information and sell it to outside companies for thousands of other dollars. So once again, we're back to this unfair trade of my data and your profits. And like we said, the DNA never changes. So as companies need more DNA samples, you know, the, for, if they're going to do tests to, to figure out, um, you know, what this part of the DNA says, they need as many, um, tests, you know, uh, to, to feed into the algorithms. They, they need samples. They need all the, you know, you can't just do it off a hundred people, off a thousand people. You need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And in order to get that, they're just buying a hundred thousand DNA, you know, results from 23andMe, from Ancestry.com. And who knows 10 years from now, what they're going to be able to do with this. Um, you know, as, as we move forward with, with government overreach and things like that, it just, it's really scary. But I, I, I do sympathize with people wanting to know where they came from. You know, we, I, I found the loophole and I made our 80 year old grandmother take it just so I could have a little bit of a window into what our family history was. Say, like, hey, hey, grandma, you, you're not going to be around here that much longer. What the fuck do you care? Here, spit in this tube. <laughs> spit in this tube. Happy birthday. <laughs> Until all of a sudden some cold case becomes a. Uh become becomes open because grandma's dna we find out that back when she was in her 30s she did bury a body yeah well funny <laughs> funny story for our audience um all our childhood our grandmother told us that we were part native american that our one of our great grandfathers or great uncles rode with buffalo bill and was was native american and i mean like most typical white people, everyone wants to feel like they're Native American. You you buy the three three wolf howling shirt, or you put a dream, <laughs> you put a fucking dream catcher in your room, and you just you want to feel a piece of this nation. Um, so we never fucking believed her, and I kind of got her that DNA test one, so I could get a little information two, so I could put to rest this whole fucking Native American bullshit. And I'll be damned if those tests didn't come back and she ain't 13% Native American. Like, like yeah, that, that was, just, that was <laughs> just slightly more than Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, just uh, like, so, <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at, she was what, one two thousandth? Like, yeah. <laughs> Graham, Graham's whole percentage point, she's almost 15%, you know, like that, that's, that's not a decent amount of chunk, you know? Oh, yeah. But the cool, uh, another cool thing was, is, you know, we always knew we were German, massively German, um, but it turns out we're German Jews. Like, <laughs> she's she's 49% Jewish, and we had no fucking clue. Yeah. There is there is nobody in our family wearing a yarmulke. I mean, like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a bar mitzvah. I feel like I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I see the appeal of doing these things, but... I need a company that's going to promise me that my my DNA is is burned, my results are under tight lock and key, my name is not attached to it. Like I need I need promises that no company is making right now. No, yeah, you're definitely not getting that promise because yeah, the the money maker is in the data. The money maker is not in the the actual test results or the, their individual relationship with you. Uh so that's uh that's part of uh, the issue with many of these companies and we're going to see this more and more uh you know it even makes me like think back to you know so when uh what was it movie pass is that the the, yep. the one that folded yeah and movie pass's business model the reason why they f they failed is they didn't set their prices high enough to sell tickets movie tickets but they didn't care and the ceo openly said he didn't care what he was after was the largest subscription base so that way he could track movie movie going shit, uh, how many movies people are seeing, what movies they're seeing, track it better. And his whole purpose, his whole business model was around getting the largest subscriber base and selling the data. Problem is he just didn't make enough money on that data fast enough 
to stop hemorrhaging money and then up folding that company. Movie, when Movie Pass first launched, it was the best best fucking thing. Any theater, any movie, like it was. I loved it. It was great. I mean, the one good thing that did come out with out of it was other subscription services that are are similar. You know, I'm an A list member, and that's been working great for me. Um, but yeah, Movie Pass was just too good to be true. Yeah, you know, it was an Icarus that flew too close to the sun. <laughs> 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 Fucking movie fast. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I guess we can move on to uh, to really our, our last batch of stories here, and uh, and that's on autonomous vehicles. And uh, we got an article from uh, from PC Mag again talking about uh, these Volvo autonomous vehicles uh, are, are coming out. They're essentially telling their company that hey, and when we talk about Volvo, these are Volvo trucks. Uh, with autonomous driving trucks, electric trucks that are ready to start taking over the road right now. And these Volvo trucks that it shows in the article, that's what I imagine of the future of, of oh, uh, yeah. these autonomous vehicles. Like, they don't even have even driver cab. cabs. <laughs> yeah, they don't even have <laughs> yeah. driver cabs. It's like a skateboard for for, for tractor trailers. Yeah, and it's, it's purely just to move these trucks uh, in and around. Uh, uh, what company were we talking about with this one? Uh, Volvo. Yeah, no, I, I'm oh, saying the company, what, uh, the Cartage company. I can't remember. Yeah, and uh, and it, it, this is international, so uh, it's not Volvo's not rolling this out here in the U.S., uh, but it, but it is getting put to test in Europe, and uh, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting uh, design. Yeah, this uh, cabless uh, truck that's going to uh, to start moving around these, uh, uh, it's, you know, the, the tractor trailers, and uh, I don't know it. it it pains me sometimes to see that you know that these technologies are being ad- adopted more openly uh, in- internationally. I understand the risk of job loss and truckers losing their jobs and everything here in the U.S. But at the same point in time, I also want us to I want us to have these cabless trucks. U B I U B I. Nah, I'm not on the U B I. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, I I. I I'd like to see this, but, uh, but yeah, this is taking place in Sweden. Um, and like I said the, you can find the article and see the picture well, of this Volvo I mean, truck. To, like, I take it a little personally too, cause our grandfather owned his own trucking company for what, 50 years, yep. you know, and he provided a great life for, for his wife, my grandmother, for her children and for, for me and my brothers, you know, um, my grandfather, did did great things for our family by by driving a truck all over the streets of Chicago. Um, so to see that this industry is going going to to go to automation and um, people of my generation and younger aren't going to have the same opportunities that my grandfather did. You know, there it, trucking driving is still a very um, I wouldn't say easy career to get into, but it, there's not many roadblocks, you know? You, yeah, you spend, not, not, not many barriers. You, you spend a couple bucks, you go to truck driving school, you take a test, you get your CDL, don't be a dummy, don't hit nothing and drive a truck, you know? And you can you can make a good living to support your family. It's one of the only careers you don't really need uh, any higher education, you know, GED or high school education is good enough for most trucking companies or or if you have a uh, good enough credit to buy your own truck, you, you don't even have to graduate fucking high school. Just get a CDL and, and buy a truck and, and pull some trailers around, you know. Um, so to see the uh, an industry with that kind of opportunity um, going away in the next decade, it's it's kind of disheartening for, for me. Well, yeah, and you know, this week we also then have uh, – in in us uh, another article that we'll have linked up on uh, on the show notes is that you know there's a self-driving truck the first cross-country trip uh here in the u.s was completed also uh a trip from california to pennsylvania uh in a self-driving uh, truck was completed this week uh and yes there's a cab in the u.s version of these trucks and yes there's a person in that cab as well um as Man, a, as a safety shit. driver but yeah he's <laughs> playing on his phone um he's he's they do bought a Nintendo. They do bought a Nintendo Switch, <laughs> and he's he's loving life right now. And uh, you know, so we, we see that that completing. So autonomous vehicles are coming. You know, we're we're you know stepping into twenty twenty with this episode, and uh, you know the the 
the twenties here, there's going to be a lot of changes. Like by 2029, is there any doubt that truck driving is largely gone other than inner city, like terminal driving? This is, this is the subject that always gets me to, to drop the okay boomers because yes, I still talk to people older than me, a generation above me, our father's age and stuff that don't believe this is going to change anything. I got into uh, a little bit of an argument with uh, one of the old timers I used to work with that I ran into about autonomous cars and electric vehicles and stuff. And he was just like, no, ain't going to happen. They're, they're, they're decades away. They're, you're, you're 30, 40 years away from, from having any of this stuff be functional and da, da, da. I was like, bro, like, are you serious right now? Like, <laughs> like, do you, like, I don't know where you get your information from yeah. or what your news is. But I rode in a Tesla that dude didn't touch the wheel for for miles. Like I like the like we are already at this point. I'm like I've seen the videos of the trucks. Like this isn't you know. And he just he was so adamant on not believing any of it, and it, that it blew my mind. Kind of like really like like this is this is truly what you feel right now. Like okay, boomer. Yeah, and I mean I, honestly. Again, this is this is one of those things. I want us to lead in this technology. I want it to happen. Uh, I understand the the next level of effects that's going to happen once you you know have these autonomous driving trucks. Then you lose truckers, and I understand those negative effects. Um, but man, I still want it. Like, not only do I want it, I also want to be able to retrofit older cars to do it because I I'm I'm out here in my RV. I don't want to drive my RV when I come out here. I want my RV to drive itself so I can take bathroom breaks. And I yeah. can do whatever the fuck I want. No, yeah. <laughs> and I can play board I mean, games in the back. I, I'm in my car so often, you know, driving around for work and doing things like that. Like, the amount of production I can gain if I didn't have to drive. You know what I mean? Like, if if while I set my car to drive in the next job, I yeah. could be doing accounting or I could be answering emails or I yeah. could be I could be typing up estimates. Like I, I commute over two hours a day uh, in my car. And if I could, if I can get that two hours of my life back it absolutely that is that is a win for society not my two hours but everybody's two hours my two hours are largely insignificant Uh, but But yeah like it you know that's why a lot of the times you see people that are in in higher careers that they make a lot of money they have private drivers not because they don't want to drive not because they they can't drive but because they realize their time is extremely valuable and if you can gain an extra five to ten hours a week of production by sitting in the back seat while somebody yeah. else drives you, it's it's worth that. You know, if I can if I can make an extra hundred grand a year by by sitting in the back seat and and working, and I only have to pay the dude driving me twenty grand, twenty five grand, I'm at a seventy five thousand dollar net profit. Like it's it's totally worth it. You know, and and I can't wait till everybody has that kind of opportunity. Yeah, I, I think uh, so. You can go give us a. It's been a while since, we, since we've heard from Nerd Stradamus. Uh, by before twenty thirty, how prevalent do you think these these vehicles are? Twenty by by twenty thirty, all highway is autonomous. Like so, I think by twenty thirty for sure, all cross country trucks are are autonomous, and then from inner city driving will either be at you know the truck you'll have like a truck stop like 20 miles outside of the city where there's just truckers sitting in a wait station waiting for an autonomous truck to pull in and it, if it's like the volvo one without the cab they just drop the trailer and then a dude gets in an electric truck with a cab and then drives it the last 20 miles or it'll be at the point where it's like drones it's it's a bunch of fat truckers sitting in a in a virtual reality simulator, and and driving the trucks the rest of the way. I I, I truly believe by twenty thirty that's that's kind of where we're at. As far as personal cars go, I'm not I don't know yet. Like I I've listened to a few podcasts where people think it's it's a five to ten year window, and I've listened to other ones where they think it's a twenty to thirty year window. Um, just because of the the amount of computing that the human brain does in anticipating other drivers, uh, the machine learning rate for self driving cars isn't where it needs to be from from what I've listened to. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think 
the consumer vehicles, it's going to be much slower to roll out. I, I don't see it within the, I think you're going to have it. Uh, I think legislation is going to slow it down terribly over the next 10 years in the sense that, you know, we're still not going to allow people to necessarily do full autonomous driving. We're not going to allow the autonomous Ubers and all these other things that have been trying to happen. Uh, I think legislation is going to kill a lot of that innovation or at least slow it significantly. And uh, But I think, yeah, definitely trucks. I, I would be surprised. I'd be surprised if I'm driving cross country on the highway uh, and I look at a truck and it's actually got a person in it. Uh, all I know is they need to put some kind of sensor in these autonomous trucks because if that truck drives by like your Winnebago and sees an eight-year-old giving the honk sign and they don't honk no more, we just <laughs> we just killed an entire generation of kids looking for something to do in the backseat. Like, to get your get your kids to get them truckers honk now, like, because it's going to okay. die. So you, you have a limited window of opportunity. What are you? What, what are you are, are, okay, okay, Boomer. What, what kids are looking out the window anymore? They're looking down at their smartphones and their tablets and whatever else. They don't give a shit about a truck driving by them. Man, that was the highlight of my trip, man. Seeing yeah, how many, old. See how many truckers I could get to honk on a highway. You're old. Yeah, I'm kids, old. Kids don't have to worry about these things anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, like, I have I had backseat video games. Like, they they still made those like Tecmo Bowlish like football <laughs> handheld video games that ran on the double A's, but you can only play them in the day because there was no nightlight behind yeah. them. So, I, I remember, I, I think my vision right now is shot from trying to play them at night, and you can only you can only call a play as you're passing like the street lights on the highway. So every five seconds, you get a glimpse of what you're doing, and you're still trying to play the fucking game. All right. Well, that wraps up this week's news. And uh, I don't know. We don't have uh, this is uh, this. Welcome to 2020. Uh, welcome to the 20s. Uh, I, th- I think this will be a big, big, uh, big decade for for change. I think we're going to, you know, every decade's got kind of their the thing. I don't know what the 10s are d- identified as, right? These from 2010 to 2019. I think it I takes a couple of years to to come up with that identity. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what our identity has been over this last decade. Is, is it right now? It's the decade of being butt hurt and mumble rap. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, I th- that's, I think that's it's, all I got right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and political divisiveness. But uh, I, I think over the next ten years, I think uh, I think it will be defined by technology. I think it will be defined by by. AI, machine learning, autonomous. Uh, it, it, I will say, as a child, as a child of the '80s that grew up on 1960s and '70s sci-fi, I'm highly fucking disappointed. <laughs> like, I'm, fucking, I'm fucking, I'm fucking highly disappointed. We are literally living in the day and age of Blade Runner, and only weirdos are humping robots. Like, <laughs> like what is going on in the world today? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, we're we're always slower than. Uh, than what sci-fi predicts for us here, and uh, we'll we'll see, we'll see uh, where we go on. Uh, another Nerdstradamus topic that we've talked about. Hey, do you think we have uh, space tourism in the 2020s? Oh, for sure. By 2025, some baller ass motherfuckers are going to be going to be going in outer orbit. You're going to see high, you know, couple million count Instagrammers, influencers. T- you know, tweeting from from outer orbit. You're gonna see rich dudes like Dan Bilzerian's gonna have titties in zero G. Like that that will be a thing by 2025. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know about 2025, but definitely by 2030, I think we're we're you're definitely gonna have uh, have some of the the, the uber rich and middle rich uh, that are are finding themselves out in uh, some space space flights. I'm hoping by 2030 we get a moon base. I just want a moon base. Like I want I want someone to be a resident of the moon. Like everyone's looking to Mars. We're going to shoot people off to to go to Mars and never come back. Like we got a two-way trip to the moon. <laughs> you you can come back eventually if you want. Like we're not yeah. gonna we're not gonna leave you on a red planet to die. Like we we can we can we can work this round trip out. You know. Yeah, I see that. I could see that in the next decade as well. Uh, some uh, not necessarily semi semi permanent. Uh, Man, build space the base. Out build there. the base in outer space, right next to the space station. Bring bring a couple crews out there. Take five, ten years to build it, and then have it land on the moon. You don't need to build it on the moon, like Death Star. That shit. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a part of it is that's what uh, that's what Starship is supposed to be able to do. It's supposed to do- be able to dock and essentially provide permanent housing. It could just stay up there. You can they could fly one, outfit one, uh, and then when it lands, it's it stays as a permanent housing and uh, and space station. So Starship has that potential. Uh, that's why I think in the next ten years we're going to get that for sure. So, all right, enough speculation. Welcome to 2020, and uh, and thanks for for listening to uh, to episode 56 of the Nerd Cantina Show. Uh, as always, hey, join us over at, at Facebook. Join the conversation. You can find us at thenerdcantina.com forward slash community, and uh, share some articles, share some memes, have some uh, have some debates as uh, as the nerd community is continuing to grow. Yeah, it's it's a fun time over there. I'm actually really proud of of that group. I, I enjoy it a lot. And uh, other than that, uh, join us next week. Talk to you later, nerds. Mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs>